My name's Nick Much. Uh, I'm currently an independent journalist based in London, but I'm originally from New Zealand, and I was an undergraduate, spent four years at Oxford, specifically at Christchurch, which is one of the most aristocratic colleges, and quite a lot of the Bullingdon members come from them, so I actually ended up knowing, knowing a few socially. Now, how I got started on this particular investigation is actually working with the German newspaper, Der Spiegel, who one day came down to Oxford and they came to the offices of the student newspaper I was working for at the time. And they said, hey, we're looking for someone to help us out with an investigation into this, or if anyone knows anyone. I just decided that I'd take it on, and I ended up getting really, really interested in the club, not just in the club as in kind of the exploits or what they've done, but also the history of the club and what this means about, you know, the British ruling class and the aristocracy and British social history. And, well, how I effectively made my break with the club, and this is, this is on record, I published this in The Independent in May, is when we were looking around, I ended up finding the tailor, Eden Ravenscroft. Now, this is the tailor, the, the Oxford branch of which makes the, the famous tailcoats, you know, the three and a half thousand pound um, costumes effectively they wear. A penguin costume is actually had George Osborne referred to it later in life. But And in the back they have an entire archive of photos. Maybe oh, 25 or 30 dates between about 1925 and 2010 all over the walls. They included one that had never been seen before of David Cameron in 1988, which has gotten, a fair, it's gotten published a fair few times now. And also other ones, including the famous one of George Osborne, uh, others of various senior figures, like this one there of Rupert Stones that I tweeted out recently. He's the CEO of Serco. Another one of Jacob Rothschild from 1959 that I'm going to run, run pretty soon. How come there's been uh, not a lot of talk about them in the press recently? Because I, I noticed this a few years ago now, uh, the Daily Mail published famously published a uh, picture of uh, Cameron in his penguin suit uh, as a Bullingdon Club member. Uh, but uh, I understand that actually there's quite a lot of pressure from the Bullingdon Club for the national newspapers not to allow these to appear in their pages. Why is that? Well, let me tell you something quite interesting. Uh, do you know... You know who Lord Rothermere, of course. His son is currently uh, a member of the Bullingdon Club. There's a, there's a nice little tidbit for you. And so uh, may, maybe that has something to What's do with What's his that. name? Also, What's his name? Uh, uh, Lord, so Lord Rothermere's son. son's name is Veer Harmsworth. Oh, Veer Harmsworth. And hang on, because they're the publishers of the Daily Mail. So maybe his son has had a word with Daddy and said, oh, we'd rather he didn't publish these. I, I can't say, I, I can't point out anything more than that, but if people want to make those inferences, they could be perfectly legitimate. There's also the fact that, or let's face it, they're extremely embarrassing for a lot of the Conservative Party. And one of the reasons is because, and this is, this is one of the points that I've made in the past, is in 2011, when the, when the riots were going on, you know, Cameron was giving this big speech about how we need to mend Britain's morally broken society, etc., etc. We need tough justice for these jobs and blah, blah, blah. And they look like awfully hypocritical to be associated with a club that is well known for vandalism, effectively. And not only that, I think they're also embarrassed to the extent of quite how many senior figures knew each other and made connections at such a young age. It means they have real trouble, you know, painting the British society or the Tory party as, as, as any sort of meritocracy. Um, the members, they seem to be newspaper editors um, and uh, leader writers for newspapers, also bankers. You mentioned Serco, who are taking over a lot of the um, jobs that used to be done by public uh, bodies, public services, government departments. They're a kind of uh, privatisation of government people. Diplomats, uh, can you just give us your own view of... of um, some of the types of people that the Bullingdon Club members go on to in later life, because it almost seems like this club is the club you join if you want to have success in politics or any other field. 
Go back to 1951, which is one of the earliest photos that I've got or that was hanging on the wall. One of the men in there is Anthony Ackland, or Anthony Ackland, sorry. He went on to be ambassador to the United States under Thatcher and then took over the position of headmaster of Eton College, Eton College where most of the Bullingdon members come from. Jacob Rothschild, as I said, is worth some, he's worth at worth nearly five billion pounds now. A lot of it is inherited family money. You also get uh, members from some of the most significant families in, in British business. For instance, you've got Valentine Guinness of the Brewing Dynasty, a member of the Sainsbury family, W.H. Uh, Smith, who's the head of the, book, to the bookshop chain, current boyfriend of, of one of the uh, girls from ABBA. The list just goes on and on and on and on. on. I mean, I remember reading something by Toby Young saying, oh, not a, you know, no one else in Cameron and Johnson's photo has gone on to anything. They've all been quite obscure. But no, one of them's a managing director at Goldman Sachs. In what planet is going on to be one of the, a very senior figure in an incredibly impressive investment bank, you know, not amounting to anything? It sounds to me as if they're deliberately trying to play it down. If they're saying that the boss of Goldman Sachs hasn't gone on to be a powerful person, uh, what about uh, uh, the... Not, not the not the boss? I'll just clarify, well, what... a managing director. So okay, well, still quite high up the chain. He does sound quite high up the chain. Um, but uh, what about the comparisons that some people have made? Uh, between the Skull and Bones Society in the United States at Yale University, because they have a similar thing there, don't they, where they get tapped. They get woken up in the middle of the night uh, and really demanded to come to a meeting, and then they get uh, selected uh, to join this club, and they can turn it down if they wish. But is uh, any idea if there's a, any similarities between the Skull and Bones, which uh, famously you had both uh, George Bush and John Kerry, who were supposed to be standing against each other as Republican and Democrat president, a few years ago, both being members of the same uh, Skull and Bones Society. Uh, any comparisons to the Bullingdon? So I've never looked into the Skull and Bones Society myself, so I don't claim any expertise on that. However, the Skull and Bones Society was originally founded on the model of the Bullingdon Club, like Harvard was founded on... Cambridge, for instance, all, the, all those American colleges were founded on these kind of Oxbridge models. Actually, there's a very, there's a very interesting article that was published in 1913 in the New York Times that actually made the exact, exact comparison. I'm happy to give you a link to the text is still worth checking out. Uh, but I think one of the differences is that it seems that, and, and I don't necessarily know this for, for, for sure, is that America is so big that in the Skull and Bone Society, people can go all over the country. It's a little bit more disparate. Whereas in the Bullingdon Club, people make these connections and they keep these connections for the rest of their career. You know, 20, 30 years later, they still... I, I can tell you for one thing, and, and this, is, this is reasonably well known, uh, that in 2008, for instance... The 1987 Club, with Cameron and Johnson, six members of them, this is according to a Daily Mail diary piece at the time, regrouped for a fundraiser for Boris Johnson's mayoral campaign. So I, I, I can't really speak with authority on the skull and bone situations, and there certainly are some similarities. But I do think the main distinguishing feature of the Bullingdon Club is quite how close the members remain later in life. Well, of course, that could be quite handy if one of your colleagues from the Bullingdon Club happens to be a banker. They may be able to tap into limitless amounts of cash for you. I'm sure. I mean, I, I can't, again, I can't point directly to any funding connections, with the exception of this one fundraiser that was, that was made. But also, let's have a look, say, at... Cameron's club, that's what we're most well-known, and, and, and let's see what some of the other people have been able to do for him. So one of the chief leader writers at the Financial Times is, is, was president of the club when, when Cameron was a member. Now, just before the election, the chief leader by the Financial Times in, endorsed Cameron. Now, they claim that it was written by him, and you can... You can believe that if, if you like. 
there's another member, another member, a guy called Sebastian James, who's the CEO of Dixon's Car Phones, worth an enormous amount of money. Cameron appointed him to the head of a panel that was overseeing state school spending. I mean, it's it, it also not only not only that is the fact that people try and they try and play down the bullying and the saying, oh, you know, it's just something we did when we were young. But no, actually. Many old members, up to say five, ten years after they graduated, go back to the club for their event. There's a, there's a good, great photo, I've seen it, and it's actually in the public domain, of George Osborne at a Bullingdon Club event in 1997, while he was at the time working on John Major's re-election campaign. You can find, a couple of years ago, photos of one of the presidents at the time at a dinner with Boris Johnson. It's just crazy how narrow this clip can be okay what about what they actually get up to i mean we've heard all about the uh japes where they take over a, a restaurant they get drunk uh, they smash the place up and then um someone comes around as a, it used to be george osborne of course in the bullington club days with a checkbook and says basically they'll write out a blank check to the owner for any damage that's done but are there any other um uh ideas that you've got about uh, what the Bullingdon Club members actually get up to? So a lot of the stories, there's, be, there's become a sort of kind of mythology around the clubs and a lot of that kind of outlandish stories have kind of gotten around. The, the, the basic point of it, which is that they get drunk, smash up restaurants, or you bet they'll, they'll just smash up the cutlery and sometimes the furniture and at one time about Seven or eight years ago, they set fire. They, they found a photo of another rival club called the Stoics on the on the wall of some pub, and they just set fire to it. Um, they also are well known for, and you know, you can judge them on this if you like. But um, considering kind of Cameron and George Osborne's pretenses to morality, they frequently hire hire strippers for their events. That's just a, that's just a well known thing that's been attested to. Quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of former members. Some of the stories that have gotten round about them, I haven't been able to find any evidence for. Like there was a story a couple of years back about them burning a fifty-pound note in front of a tram. Now I did looked into this quite closely, and I couldn't find any evidence for it. And not only that, and uh, this is slightly in their defence, the things they tend to do, while they tend to be very thoughtless and very sort of outrageous and uncaring. They seem to do things that are deliberately malicious, like that story suggested, not as often. I mean, you can make plenty of ethical judgments about them, but there are some stories about them that I think are exaggerated. Nick, I noticed that uh, you've uh, uncovered uh, several members of the Bullying Club that people didn't realise were members from these old photographs including Cecil Rhodes maybe you could say something about him because I noticed that there's actually a campaign in Oxford at the moment uh, to get his statue removed because of the uh, effectively genocide that he's uh, accused of uh, being involved in Britain's colonial history so one of the things I don't think often realise is quite how much club the influence how much influence the club used to have in the 19th century and how much influence it's actually had over time. Cecil Rhodes is by no means the only significant figure. For instance, one of the, a prime minister from the 19th century, at least one prime minister, um, Archibald Primrose, the Earl of Rosary, was a member, Randolph Churchill, who is Winston Churchill's father and was with the Exchequer, he was a member. Cecil Rhodes was a member in 1877. And what I think this shows is that this sort of club has almost been a a kind of a finishing school for a lot of Britain's elite for quite some time. One other document I managed to get hold of, for instance, was a full club membership list between 1850 and 1899. Now, there's at least 100 peers in that, at least 50 members of a house commons the 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 post of first lord of the admiralty i managed to identify five people in that list who were who were on that post um uh, as i said a prime minister chancellor a couple of foreign secretaries and one thing that i think this shows is that 
this idea it, it, it's quite how much things haven't changed since the 19th century. In the 19th century, all these powerful people went through the club, and now all these powerful people are still going through the club again, or all this kind of time later. It's a little bit like that 21st century is mirroring the, the class system of the 19th century, or at least this might be emerging that way. Um, well, I imagine Bullingdon Club members and those that send their kids to Oxford and the, who then join the Bullingdon would say, well, this is the way it's always been, and um, actually we want the best for our kids, uh, whether that's a good Oxford ed- education. And the Bullingdon Club is actually a good way to, for them to link up and network with other people who are potentially going to be powerful in the future from wealthy families. So what's the problem? Well, I mean, that's exactly, it's perfectly in their self-interest to do that, and I don't even necessarily judge someone who joins the billing department. Actually, I knew a couple of them, and uh, per- person- and they, they, can, they can be very personable people. And what I just think, that, and so I'm, I, I'm not judging them on an individual level, and actually, I think you can make a, an argument that, okay, you know, this is just what people did when they were young, and we should forget what this all is. But what the same time kind of gets me is the fact that they all then, then turn around, they try and have the photographs suppressed and stop them being published, they try and deny the events that go on. And so what tends to happen is it's not just they tend to make these networks, but another factor of it is that when they all get into this club or similar clubs and they go around smashing up places together and indulging in this kind of behaviour, then they all will have effectively influence over each other at, at, at times in the future because they'll all know what each other's done and they'll probably have some kind of that influence on these people in, in, in ways that might not be good for the rest of the country, even if it's good for them. So what you're saying is effectively that um, their loyalty may be more to the club than it is to the rest of us, especially if they're involved in uh, public life. You mentioned a few other clubs. Is the Bullingdon not the only one then? So, no. there are. So actually, drinking clubs are very, very common in Oxford. Um, there's another one. So there's, but, but how the structure basically works is there's, there's, there's a club called the Gridiron, which is biggest maybe about there can be over 50 people in that if you can ask just ask you to talk about which is asking you about other clubs not just the Bullingdon it's not the only one is it so basically how how, how, it all, how the structure anyway works is there's, there's one club called the Gridiron Club is that I don't know 50 or so people in that and what they tend to do is then the other clubs of which there are so there's the, the one called the Frat there's another one called the Stowe now, the Stoics is actually quite a lot more people are joining that now. One of the reasons a lot of people are turning the Bullingdon Club down now is simply because there's so much publicity in the current Conservative government. And so a lot of people are now joining this club called the Stoics, which is a newer club. The, the kind of people are the same people who would join the Bullingdon, but don't quite want that level of, of sort of scrutiny. So I couldn't really name anyone well known. There's also the Piers Gaveston Society, which has now become pretty well known due to the allegations about Cameron's indiscretions there. And there are, although there are, there are other clubs at Cambridge, Cambridge Apostles is a pretty well, well known group. There's a Cambridge equivalent of the Bullingdon as well. And that's called the Pit Club, and they often actually have crossovers. So, you know, you can find that they, they both actually started as cricket clubs, or at least the Bullingdon did. De, de, I'm not entirely sure about the Pit Club. For instance, you can find photos of cricket matches between between the two clubs. There's another club in Cambridge called the Athenaeum Club. Right, you can find some very nice photographs. One of them was published recently in, in Lord Ashcroft's book of Cameron in his Bullingdon uniform at Ball in Cambridge. And I'm sure, I'm sure there, are, there are other clubs like these at, at other universities. And it, 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 it's a fairly, fairly consistent feature of of the undergraduate experience. Can you just tell us a bit about your, uh, how we can follow your work online, Nick? So, uh, you know, how can we get, stay in touch with some of your research on these people? I'm mainly a journalist with byline.com. You can follow me on my Twitter handle is at Nick T. Much, M-U-T-C-H, and most of my work will be published there. I published uh, a few pieces on the on the club in the past in The Independent, uh, ran a couple of pieces about, about them in May, but I've got one very, very major piece coming up, and that will be with The Daily Beast, and that should be coming out within the next couple of days. This is a proper full several thousand words about the club and its history and 
who's been in it and everything like that. So that's really the big one to wait for. But the photos, I'll be running one or two at a time on byline with explanations of who's in what it means and, and, and what they got up to. If I can sort of end on, on one final thing, and this is um, the uh, one of the things that's often brought up about about the photos and whether they should be published and whether it's a, it's okay to judge kind of our politicians based on their university lives. One thing I would want to say, and this is my justification, is that these photographs are, in my opinion, the historical documents. They're extremely interesting windows into the formative years of some of the most powerful people in the country and how the, how the how they were educated, the connections they made there, how those connections affect them later in lives. You're perfectly welcome to look at the photographs and go, you know what, I don't care. I don't care what these people did. I care. I base them on their competence of running the country now. But fundamentally, I think historical documents that are just important to know for the sake of what the country's past was and what the country's future is going to be and bring judgments from there. Okay, Nick, thanks very much. Bye. All the best. Thanks very much. That's all for this week. Dialect is Bristol's first weekly MP3 podcast broadcast on community radio stations in Bristol, Swindon, Preston and St Albans over the years. You can subscribe to our emails or download the podcast from dialectradio.co.uk. Thanks to our guests, firstly Peace Handovsky from the Eastern Cowboys, just back from Palestine. Fascinating experience he had there too. Also, Avonmouth Action Group, Steve Norman on the privatisation of the port we heard from, and Nick Much from Oxford, now in London, on the Elite Bullingdon Club. Dialect is a Bristol Broadband Co-op production and anyone can contribute. Contact us through Volunteering Bristol on 0117 989 or at bristolvolunteers.org.uk. That was Dialect, and I'm Tony Gosling. Wishing you a very good week. Thanks for listening. Till the same time next week. Goodbye for now.